Hey, thank you very much for clicking on this video. Um, this video is entitled New Shakespeare Finds. My name is Glenn Alexander and I hope today to share with you some really, really exciting uh, finds, some new Shakespeare works and some important revelations. Uh, to do so, we're going to go on a bit of a goose chase together to find uh, the source of where geese apparently come from. Um, now, I should say I've written about a lot of uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today uh, in the author, uh, which is a book I, I published about over a month ago now, uh, which has got a lot of this stuff in, although it's uh, it was written in four weeks. I was very excited and sleep deprived, so forgive any faults, uh, but it's all there. Uh, now, also forgive me if I ramble a little bit because I'm doing this without notes. I'm just going to do this um, off the top of my head, so please bear with me, but I hope it's the ideas and the revelations uh, that get you really, really excited. Uh, so we're going to start our, our goose chase uh, where it actually did start, uh, which was with this wonderful human being here, Sir Mark Rylance, saying something very eloquent and wonderful. Um, he couldn't remember where it was from. Uh, he knew it was from a Greek, but it turns out the Greek it was from was Homogenes. Um, so I read this wonderful book by Annabelle M. Patterson called Homogenes and the Renaissance. Brilliant book. Uh, I'm very glad... Um, and thankful that I did because it had one too many footnotes and references uh, to another book. Uh, and this book uh, is a masterpiece. This book is called The Art of English Posy. Uh, it was actually published originally uh, without the name of an author on this book. Uh, it's a tour de force, a, a masterpiece. It, it's, it's incredible and probably now... Uh, one of, if not my favourite, books. Um, in it, there's a lot of brilliance, but there's also some very remarkable things that go on inside of it. Um, on my first read of it, I actually missed a really, really important thing. And I'd like to try to make you aware of that uh, very important thing. So when you come uh, to read it, you don't overlook it. Uh, but we're before we come to that, um, I'm just I just want to kind of show you some really exciting things which have kind of come from uh, some of the keys that are in the art of English poetry. So this may and I hope is familiar with you. Uh, this is the title page of the first folio published in 1623. You've got uh, the uh, most famous and iconic uh, portrait of Mr. William Shakespeare on the right and uh, what what's believed to be Ben Jonson's. Uh, preface or dedication uh, on the left and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to wake you up a little bit that there's actually more here than meets the eye um, uh, and the reason I kind of found all this stuff is because of a key in the art of English poesy uh, which then helped me unlock uh, some things or kind of understand the sonnets a little bit better which turn out those cryptic sonnets have instructions in them uh, and if you follow uh, some instructions you might want to take some multiple copies of the Drusau portrait uh, and then find a very dark room and a bright light because if you put mo multiple copies of the Drusau portrait on top of each other uh, and shine a light through you're going to start to make some very very interesting things uh, so if you you can see you have to align the eyes to get the images uh, but you can see there's some really interesting uh, images that are some form of king wearing a crown of, of some description. There's some there's some really weird um, things that are going on there, uh, and of course like there's loads of sonnet references, um, which like a, in in the book. Since I left you, mine eye is in my mind. Um, I should point out this this seems to be. Uh, I'll let if Dr. G Jordan Peterson is out there somewhere. Uh, maybe he could uh, explain these images a bit better than uh, me. But you've got the uh, mandala, which is represents transcendence, uh, and the eye, third eye, enlightenment. So he's literally transcending himself. Um, so yeah, you you can change which eyes you align and how many copies you're using. Here you have a picture of a lamb. Uh, if like a lamb, he could his looks translate. Well, he did translate his looks. And there is 
a lamb. Uh, there's quite a lot of these and there's a lot of stuff that you can do with this portrait. I'm not even going to try explaining that. A uh, lot of heart and chest references. Uh, you can see, oh, Glenn, there's a, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ease on this doublet. All the blank panels of the, uh, the, the doublet. Uh, there's stuff written on them pretty much, but you can see uh, there's some initials or whatever it might be across his heart. I'm not going to speculate too much on that as of yet. Um, it might be something written across his brow and going all the way down his cheek too. Uh, you can see, obviously, there's, there's something wrong with his portrait. Like you can see he's like wearing a mask. He's got a very stiff page-like collar. The doublet's on the wrong way, um, which is probably why you need to like flip uh, the portrait. Uh, so there's loads of brilliance going on here, which I kind of explain more in my book. Lots of like anagrams and weird and wonderful things. Uh, but my main interest really is to do with this left side. Uh, this left side is really uh, interesting, this dedication by Ben Johnson. Uh, so let's just have a closer inspection. To the reader, this figure that thou here seest put, it was for gentle Shakespeare cut wherein the graver had a strife with nature to outdo the life. Oh, could he but have drawn his wit as well in brass as he, as he hath hit his face? The print would then surpass all that was ever writ in brass, but since he cannot, reader, look not on his picture, but his book. Now, there's so many brilliant and cunning devices that are going on um, here, I, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, things I do want you to be aware of, all the capital letters are really, really important there. If you have a look at uh, Oakwood and his face, likewise, spaces and punctuation, also quite important. Uh, they're actually anagrams, but I'm not going to discuss that now. Uh, so, the key things I kind of really want to draw your attention to, this figure. Uh, figures are important because book three of The Art of English Posy is all about figures and ornaments. And this... Uh, poem in itself is a figure it is a figure of, of rhetoric there's loads of devices that are going on so this figure is referring not well it is as well it's ambiguous i suppose uh, not just to the juice out portrait but what is written here note to the reader uh, these uh, you'll notice that all the uh, the w's are actually uh, two v's they're not quite joined um that's really important and we'll discuss that a little bit later uh, print, that's quite important as well. Reader, look not on his picture, weird to see that, uh, but his book by Ben Johnson. Now, if I asked you what was the most bold character there, I'd hope you might tell me it's the E. You might also notice it's been italicised um, in the title. Uh, I believe that's because. It's telling you not to look on his picture, but his book. Uh, and quite naturally, you might assume that's the first folio, because that's uh, the book in which you're in. But I actually think that's referring to the art of English posy. Note the E on the end of art. Now, we're going to come back to a few of the things that are in Ben Johnson's uh, poem there because you're going to see these occur again and again um, I uh, as I said I think this is a masterpiece oh is that a brass anchor oh ignore that oh it's pointing to a V ignore that as well uh, there's loads of stuff that's kind of going on here which I'll probably explain in a uh, later video at some stage but there's just so many great things uh, so the thing that I missed uh, on the first read because typically you want to get straight into the, the heart of the matter, uh, was the printer's uh, preface. Uh, please don't skip this. It is really, really important you don't because it's brilliant um, and is very, very witty. Um, yeah, it, it's just, it's, it's wonderful. So we're going to have a look at this uh, today and um, hopefully it's going to give us some keys to kind of um, unlock some of the devices in the art itself. So if we have a look at it, it's printed by Richard Field, dwelling in the Blackfriars, note the capital letters there please, near Ludgate in 1589. To the right honourable Sir William Cecil Knight, Lord uh, Burley, uh, Lord High Treasurer R.F. The printer wisheth him health 
and prosperity. Evidently, I can't read, can I? Uh, with commandment and use of his continual service. Uh, so that's the start of it. As I said, note very carefully the capital letters. They are important. Um, also, that's not how you spell near. How interesting. Uh, so let's have a look at what's going on here. Uh, this book. Now, the first thing I want you to look at is this book. Right. The last two words of Ben Johnson's uh, preface or dedication was his book with the E on the end. The first two words of this book is this book, which has his book uh, in it. Okay, so already I hope you're kind of going, OK, um, I maybe should pay attention to this. Um, unlike me on the first read. Uh, so this book. Right Honourable, coming to my hands with his bare title without any author's name or any other ordinary address, I doubted how well it might become me to make you a present thereof, seeming by many express passages in the same at large, that it was by the author intended to our sovereign lady, the Queen, and for her recreation and service chiefly devised, in which case to make any other person her highest partner in the honour of his gift, it could not stand with my duty, nor be without some prejudice to Her Majesty's interest and his merit. Perceiving, besides the title, to purport so slender a subject as nothing almost could be more discrepant from the gravity of your years and honourable function, whose contemplations are every hour more seriously employed upon the public administration and services. I thought no condign gratification, nor scarce any good satisfaction for such a person as you. Yet when I consider that bestowing upon your lordship the first view of this mine impression, a feat of mine own simple faculty, it could not cipher Her Majesty's honour or prerogative in the gift, nor yet the author of his thanks. And seeing the thing itself to be a device of some novelty, which commonly it giveth every good thing a special grace, and a novelty so highly tending to the most worthy praises of Her Majesty's most excellent name. So deeper to you, I dare conceive them any worldly thing besides love, although I could not devise to have presented your lordship any gift more agreeable to your appetite, or fitter for my vocation and ability to bestow your lordship being learned and a lover of learning. My present a book and myself a printer always ready and desirous to be at your honourable commandment and thus I humbly take my leave from the Blackfriars this 28th of May 1589. Your honour's most humble at commandment RF. Uh, now there's loads of great things going on here so we're going to take a look at some of them. Uh, firstly just note the E's. Okay? The E's at the end uh, which have been added. Uh, the main one I want to focus on for the minute is myself a printer. Notice how my present a book and myself a printer. Notice how that E has jumped to the ending of self, uh, condign uh, gratification, uh, uh, which means uh, altogether worthy uh, from the Latin. Um, uh, there's there's loads of great things going on there. Next one, have a look at the um, uh, have a look at the first person here. Let's let's kind of just ignore all of the second and third uh, person and just have a look at the first person coming to my hands. I doubted how well it might become me. It could not stand my duty. I thought no condign gratification. Yet when I consider the first view of this mine impression, a feat of mine own simple faculty. I dare conceive them. I could not devise to have presented uh, or fitter for my vocation ability to bestow my present a book and myself a printer. So I think it's it, it's becoming more obvious that the printer uh, is the person um, who has done this feat and is presenting uh, this present. The printer is the person uh, who has written this book. Uh, if we have a look at what's going on with this idea of nothing as well is really important. Now, nothing and no one are ideas uh, that you're going to see a lot 
uh, in the sonnets uh, as well. This is really important. So with his bare title, bare, like not much, where it's without any author's name or any ordinary address. That's really important. The Art of English Poesy was printed originally without the name of any author. Um, if you see any author's name on the front, it's a red herring, so be very, very careful. Uh, doubted how well it might become me, uh, perceiving besides the title to, to purport so slender a subject as nothing almost could be. Uh, it could not cipher, cipher the archaic uh, usage of that uh, actually meant the figure of naught or nothing, uh, nor yet the author of his thanks and seeing the thing. Well, what is a thing? It's a, a, a thing is a thing we choose not to give a name to itself to be a device of some novelty. Um, and there's other stuff like person as well. If you think about where that's come from, uh, I humbly take my leave. I humbly someone's I, his identity is about to take. Uh, his leave. Um, and if we also have a look at this, this is really, really important um, to conceive them any worldly thing besides love. So deeper to you, I dare conceive them any worldly thing besides love. So things are being conceived besides love. Love here is quite important um, and will be for pretty much everything. Um, and you can see in the same, this is still one sentence, uh, presented your lordship any gift more agreeable after blah, 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 uh, being a learned and lover of learning. So we've got love again, my present, a book, and myself, a printer, always ready and desirous. So love and desire are quite important things here um, because he's conceiving something and he, besides love and desire. That's really, really important as well. Uh, and lastly, I humbly take my leave from Blackfriars. Notice, can you see that the inversion of the capital letters there? Uh, it was a lowercase b before and a capital F. There's an inversion there. Something's going on and uh, I'm hoping that you're starting to see it because the printer isn't perhaps the printer. Uh, this 28th of May 1589, hold on to that. That is really, really important, as I'll show you uh, shortly. Uh, so the art of English prosy, as I said, is an absolute uh, masterpiece. Um, pretty much on every page, he's divulging uh, who the author of this brilliant work actually is, um, all the way through, <laughs> right, right from the title, <laughs> um, all the way through, he's telling you uh, who... Uh, the author is, but through many, many devices and figures of ornament um, and rhetoric, which he uh, actually teaches. So he's very, he's very much modelling that which he is teaching. And he tells you quite explicitly sometimes uh, the things um, he is doing. You just need to either read between the lines or read the other meaning in it to understand it. Uh, so who is the author? Now, I my, my job is what I want to do here is kind of make you aware of some of these key uh, devices. So when you come to read it, you're going to be paying attention um, to some of these things. So the first one. Now, first things and last things are always important. So the first figure of rhetoric uh, and the last figure, just in the speech, the first bit and the last bit are the things people remember. Uh, so the, the figures that he starts with is the figure of surplus. Notice the E on the end of surplus. This is a figure of addition and surplus. And he's put an added E, it doesn't need to be there, on the end of the word. Uh, uh, and that has this bit at, at the end of the words when he's talking about it. Uh, and he's elided it. So it, it, he's, he's kind of really alerting your attention to this E on the end. Uh, the figure of clear exchange. Now, often from Latin and early English, the U and V could be interchanged. That's not to say that's not done without cunning and thought. Often he's been very deliberate in the U's and the V's and where he's using them. So just be really um, careful with this figure of clear exchange. Uh, the figure of uh, prosonomasia uh, or the nicknamer. So often a nom de plume, uh, like another name. And the one I really want you to watch out for when you come to read The Art of English Prosy is the noble gentlemen. There are some really um, 
important references where he uses this term noble gentleman. Please do watch out for them. Uh, the figure of repetition, uh, particularly uh, with certain names, e.g. Edward, for instance, um, it, it's a brave figure as he describes it, and it, it, it's a it's a really key figure. Uh, the figure of uh, metonymia and uh, metonymia, or the misnamer. So, for instance, uh, instead of desire, uh, Cupid, uh, for instance. There's quite a lot of that. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of figures in this book which he employs. Um, so, uh, also, first off, you, you're going to want an original um, translation of this. Do not get a translated version, else you're going to miss all of the wit uh, and the cunning that's been employed. Uh, and crucially, please watch out for any spelling mistakes. If there's a spelling mistake, there might be, but if there are any spelling mistakes, I prefer if you think of it as it's something to alert your attention to something because frequently it really really does there are deliberate spelling mistakes to kind of make you pay attention to something important either preceding or after watch out for those spelling mistakes please so who is our author um well as i said it's disclosed manifestly throughout his book um but before he reveals his identity through these devices uh, he has a brilliant setup he literally tells you exactly how he's going to disclose and divulge his own identity uh, so this is from uh, book three chapter 18 uh, and this is the figure of periphrasis or the figure of ambage um, you, you'll know, you'll start to see some of these figures as we read uh, then have you yet the figure of periphrasis holding somewhat of the dissembler by reason of a secret intent not appearing by the words, as when we go about the bush, and will not in one or a few words express that thing which we desire to have known, uh, but do choose rather to do it by many words, as we ourselves wrote of our sovereign lady, thus whom princess, princes serve and realms obey, and the greatest of Britain kings begot, she came abroad even yesterday, when such as saw her knew her not and the rest that followeth, meaning her majesty's person, which we would seem to hide, leaving her name unspoken to the intent the reader should guess at it. Nevertheless, upon the matter, you can really start to see this, upon the matter did so manifestly disclose it as any simple judgment might easily perceive by whom it was meant, that is, by Lady Elizabeth, Queen of England, and daughter to King Henry the Eighth. Oh, Mr. H, no, how interesting. And therein resteth uh, the dissimulation. It is one of gal uh, one of the gallantest figures among the poets, uh, so it be used discreetly and in his right kind. Notice the E on the end. But many of these makers that be not half their craft masters do very often abuse it, and also many ways. For if the thing or person they go about to describe by circumstance be by the writer's improvidence otherwise betray, uh, betrayed. Oh, look at that. That's interesting. Um, that that double V there. Um, it loseth the grace of a figure, as he that said, the 10th of March, when he is received, and Phoebus raises into his horned head, um, intending to describe the spring of the year, which every man knoweth of himself hearing the day of March named. The verses be very good, the figure naught, nothing, worth. If it were meant in paraphrasis uh, for the matter, um, that is the season of the year, which should have been covertly disclosed by Ambarge, was by and by blabbed out by naming the day of the month, uh, and so the purpose of the figure disappointed. Notice the spelling mistake there. Uh, per adventure, it hath been uh, better to have said thus the month and date when Ares received Dan Phoebus raises uh, into his horned head for now there remaineth there's a lovely word hidden within that word for the reader somewhat to study and guess upon and yet the springtime to the learned uh, judgment sufficiently expressed um, so he's telling you exactly how he's going to uh, reveal this by naming the month of spring if you think back to what we've already said you may already be expecting what's to come uh, so who is the author well 
he wants you to guess at this, uh, but he's this question is there. Who is the author? Well, how do you answer a question? Well, uh, the figure of response is a good place to start uh, answering a question. And unsurprisingly, book three, chapter 19, he does indeed uh, reveal his identity using this figure. So the last poem, last example poem uh, in the figure of response, who is the author? Edwards, Earl of Oxford, a most noble and learned gentleman made in this figure of response an emblem of desire otherwise called Cupid, which for his excellency and wit I set down some part of the verses, for example, when wert thou born desire, in pomp and prime of May, by whom sweet boy wert thou begot, by good conceit, men say, tell me who was thy, uh, they a nurse? Fresh youth in sugared joy, what was thy meat and daily food? Sad sighs with great annoy, what hast thou then to drink? Unfeigned lover's tears, what cradle wert thou rocked in? In hope devoid of tears. So, hopefully you can see some of the devices, uh, the, like the culmination of so many important uh, devices in this really really important poem so first off we've got the e uh, on earl uh, we've got the noble gentleman if you remember uh, that this figure remember how ben johnson starts his poem this figure well here we have this figure of response an emblem oh we've dropped the m there of desire otherwise called uh, cupid um, again we have cupid with an e on the end that's like two in one cupid which for his excellency and wit i set down and even a blatant admission i set down e on that down some parts of the verses for example when wert thou born desire you can see all of these devices look at the, the number of uh, the figure of surplus there on the end of these words you've got so many e's you've got the love you've got the desire you've got the, uh, the noble gentleman you've got the cupid and most importantly he's told you how he's going to reveal his identity by naming the month of spring in pomp and prime of may so he through all the devices and the culmination of them he really discloses his identity as edward earl of oxford so an author uh, of the uh, of the Art of English Poesy is indeed uh, Edward Earl of Oxford. Now, this will come as no surprise to the many people who have already thought this, either um, covertly or openly throughout history. Here's some of those people um, who um, stated their belief in Edward de Vere. Um, you've got quite a few of them. Um, there's even more women actually visited Westminster Abbey a few days ago and I've got strong reason to believe the Bronte sisters and Jane Austen also me um, so there's a lot of people there uh, who even Keanu Reeves um, the Matrix Falls coming out at the end of December even Keanu Reeves um, is a Deverian so a lot of people uh, have long since suspected this so this comes as a a nice confirmation uh, for those people. So that's the figure of response. We now know who the author of the art of English prosody is. Um, but to continue on our goose chase, I wanted to know where this poem came from because he it's a, he set down some of the verses, some part of the verses. So I wanted to find the whole entire uh, poem. Um, and, uh, well, apparently, I'll, I'll show you the one, apparently it's in Britain's Bar of uh, Delights. Um, but while I was trying to find it, apparently there's a version um, on, uh, I think it's Wikisource or something, and on a few websites, um, that has an alternate title, Come Hither Shepherd Swain. Uh, Sir, what do you require? I pray thee, show me to your name. My name is Fond Desire, and then it continues with the poem that you've already seen when work that born desire uh, so if that's true um that's a further confirmation i can't seem to find this actually which is uh, really interesting this this first verse uh, all i can find is uh, when work thou born desire and i found it um the first uh, publication apparently is in britain's bower of delights uh, it's poem number 40 um those of you who follow the incredible scholar Alexander Waugh's work you'll know that 40 is an important 
uh, number. So it's poem number uh, 40. Uh, I've got some reasons which I've put in the book as to why 40 uh, is important. I've got my own interpretations as to why that is. It's a number he very much self-identifies with and there's a reason for that oh look bringing up design uh, so you can there's loads of de uh, devices that are going on here and there's also uh, some later uh, lines in the poem that haven't been included they're also really really important uh, but i'll probably talk about that uh, in another rambling video uh, but while i was reading this poem i started to read some of the other poems and i noticed a very very familiar voice and saw a lot of devices that I knew uh, all through the book, which made me think, actually, um, I reckon uh, Edward, uh, Edward of Oxford, uh, Edward de Vere was the 17th Earl of Oxford, sometimes went by the name of Edward Oxenford as well. Um, I, I've got reason to believe that he wrote this. So I, I checked out the title page because the title page typically gives away uh, who's written this. Uh, and I started to notice some devices. Uh, now, the T is really important. Uh, we, we'll come to that a little bit later, actually. Um, it's got a long history with the ox. Um, it comes from the Hebrew tav, which means uh, mark. Um, it was the mark for the oxes to aim at um, uh, in the fields. So it's got a, a strong history with the ox. You can see like the ox's horns. Uh, kind of subtly hinted that in there. Uh, you can see the double V, um, which you saw actually um, in Ben Johnson's poem, and you're going to see this again, and I'll explain that shortly. But most importantly, it's by N.B. Gent. And I told you, noble gentleman is very, very important. So this is his nom de plume here. It's noble gent. It's by noble gent. And there's loads of other things that kind of hint to it, which I'll probably talk about at a later stage. Uh, so I thought, oh, OK, if this is by the noble gent and I've reason to believe it's by Edward de Vere, are there any other um, uh, publications by the noble gent? And it turns out there's quite a few. This book in particular, I think, is uh, really important. Again, you're going to start to see some of the devices. Uh, there's loads of these things um, going on. Um, and there's quite a few more MB Gent publications, so there's some new uh, finds for you. Uh, but that's uh, not all. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna skip a few links in in the book that I wrote. It's very much kind of a linear. Um, it's like a stream of consciousness where I'm just discovering this stuff um, in linear, and, and you can you can kind of share that journey of watching me discover, um, kind of make make some discoveries. Uh, so I'm going to skip a couple of links because it's just going to go off way off on a tangent. If I do it in this video, it'll be far too long. Um, but uh, I'm going to alert you to this. Now, um, Alexander Ward did a fantastic video called uh, uh, Where Was Shakespeare Really Buried? Uh, which is really, really interesting. Um, it's got loads of interesting ideas and I, I agree with like, so much of what he's he's said there. Um, in it, he um, he says some really interesting things about um, there's this plaque which feels a bit incongruous because it's different material above his head uh, and he said something quite interesting about um, he also explains why the Latin's not quite right um, I, I do try to explain why uh, why I believe some of it might not be uh, quite right uh, but one of the most interesting things he said was there's no crown of bays which is typical for a poet around the head of the bard how interesting now what I noticed was well, actually there is a crown of uh, bays. It's not around the head, but if you have a look here, here's the wreath of laurels or crown of bays, same thing, um, around this uh, this dagger, uh, pointing to this uh, prince. And if you if you look um, closely, actually, you'll see it's uh, on a tragic mask. I was like, oh, okay. Um, is that telling you to have a look at Hamlet? Well, I believe it uh, does because Hamlet, and I'll probably go into this in another video as well. Um, he pretty much gives you instructions. Um, if, have a look at the first folio. Um, he gives you instructions uh, to have a look at this, which is the West, uh, not the Westminster Funerary Monument. This is the um, uh, the Stratford Funerary Monument uh, at Holy Trinity Church. Um, sh Hamlet gives you instructions to have a look at this. Uh, and this is really, really important, just as is the Westminster Monument. Uh, for th some of the things we've been talking about, about the art of English poesy, uh, perhaps you might 
be able to start to see where I'm going with this. Um, but before we do that, I'm just I just want to alert you to this double V that we've been uh, talking about. Um, so again, Alexander Wall, who is phenomenal, go check out his videos. Um, shows us in one of uh, his videos, John D's Secret Patron Revealed, circa 1840, um, that he uh, Edward de Vere signs a letter. So I think John Lilly, if, if I remember right, uh, saying yours at an hour's warning, double V. Now why double V? Do Vere two V. Uh, double de Vere. Uh, so these two V's are again kind of a uh, nickname for um, Edward de Vere. There's also a, a hidden uh, V at the bottom there. Uh, you've seen this already just in the Stratford Funerary Monument and you've also seen these two V's uh, in uh, Ben Johnson's dedication. Uh, if you see an N, um, transformations are pretty important. Uh, to Shakespeare, partly because he was a big fan of Ovid, so he plays with a lot of transformations. You saw that in the uh, in the portrait, um, the rotations, the flipping it. There's a lot of um, reflections and rotations and enlargements and, and translations. All 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 of the transformations are going on. So just be aware of those ends. Often they're also double V's, uh, and you start to see it here. So if you see a double V, um, kind of make sharp your eyes and keen your ears because it's probably an indication uh, that De Vere is about. Uh, so if we have a look at this and talk about what I was going to say, um, the reason why the art of English prosy is so important is because this pretty much tells you uh, to see the art of English prosy, uh, as we're going to see. Now you may see the art right there, really clearly in the first line, right? Uh, it's right there. But actually, there's quite a few arts here. Uh, so there's a uh, oh, there's there's one directly below it, and uh, oh, there's a uh, there's another one there. These are anagrams. You can see there's an art there and an art there and an art there. So you've got art four times in the first two lines. Um, okay, I'd, I'd say that's uh, that's that's quite important. Uh, but you can also um, see in the bottom line here. Uh, perhaps I should read this. Um, Stay passenger, why goest thou by so fast? Read if thou canst, uh, whom envious death hath plast within this monument. Shakespeare, with whom quick nature died, whose name doth deck. I read that as C, tomb. That's important though. Far more than cost. C, all uh, he hath writ. Um, leaves living art, but page uh, to serve uh, his writ. Uh, wit. I missed that. That's yet he hath writ. Um, I believe that's yet. Uh, he hath writ. Leaves living art but page to serve his wit. So you've got a living art here and a but page to serve his wit. There's also some, uh, <laughs> mate, you can you can make quite a few arts uh, in this if you start playing between lines as well. But the most important thing uh, from this monument, there's lots of brilliance that goes on. He was a language scholar, um, so like he knew his Greek and Latin. And he often has like witty puns uh, to do with translations between Greek and Latin, Hebrew and like <laughs> Germanic languages. Um, he's he was an, he he knew his language. Uh, the most important thing I want to kind of get you to see here is in the main body of the text. And again, the first and the last is always important. So the first line of this and the last line of this. Stay, passenger, why goest thou by so fast? Read if thou canst. See all he hath writ, leaves living art, but page to serve his wit. Now, I am pretty darn sure that that is telling you, don't read so fast, don't do what I did in skip the printer's preface, read, uh, slow down um, and read the printer's preface because he has uh, left but page. Remember the buts, as I said, um, from and you can see the V there as well, uh, but page to serve his wit. And that is the, uh, the crux of the argument. It's the keys within this that start unlocking the identity uh, to who is the author of the art of English poesy and who Shakespeare is. Um, actually, he, he tells you, but you just need to make sure you read um, so he can tell you the devices he's using. 
Um, so that's that's the monument. I'll probably go into that in more detail a bit later in another video. Um, but if we go to um, back to the Westminster Monument, which is quite frankly brilliant, and there's loads of great things uh, both on it and around it. Um, if we have a look at here, I'm going to give you a few seconds. Can you spot the art there? There we go. Uh, so there's a beautiful little uh, art triangle uh, within the uh, Westminster uh, Monument there as well. Um, probably why Lawrence Olivier's um, buried in front of him with some triangles in his. Um, yeah, so if we also look at some really important things here. Now, Alexander, um, which I adore and I don't disagree with, uh, talked about the posture of the uh, the monument and how he's in a Cairo, the XP um, symbol here. Uh, I actually think there's also something really interesting that he's doing with his arms, uh, which is this. They form an E. Uh, and we've seen quite a few E's already. You might be going, okay, his arms are an E, are you just reading too much into that? Well, then I'd say, have a look at what he is pointing to, uh, because that is a huge giveaway. Um, <laughs> so if you have a look, if we zoom in on this, um, so this is from The Tempest, and this is actually brilliant as well. Now, if you look at what he's pointing to, uh, solemn temples, um, now a lot of People believe it's dedicated to Templarism as Templar stuff. That might be true. I don't mind. But the, the most important thing, uh, I think, is what he's pointing to, which is this letter E. This letter E is really, really important. Uh, and it's emphasised because in the first um, uh, line, the cloud cap towers, uh, actually, um, if we have a look at the cloud cap towers um, in, in the Tempest, there's an E in that. So here, that E's been taken out. It's it, um, So it's it's just to really, really emphasise um, that the E is in temples. Um, now, if we have a look at where this is from, this is just like brilliant. Like all of this is just incredible. If we have a look at um, what Prospero is saying in Act 4 of The Tempest, I think. Um, so if we have a look uh, where this is coming from... Um, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, ye all which it inherits shall dissolve, and like the insubst insubstantial uh, pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. Uh, we are such stuff as dreams are made. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, now, the important thing is to notice the similarities and differences between these two things. Um, there's lots of really brilliant stuff. Now, if we look at where it's starting, and melted into air, into thin air. Now, I could say that Y is almost like a T, uh, which, of course, would be art. Hmm. So he's disappearing into his art, um, which I very much believe uh, he has quite literally uh, in all of Shakespeare's canon. And like, uh, so if we have a look at this, uh, and like the basic fabri fabric of vision, vision, that's not in the right place, is it? And like the baseless fabric of this vision, it's not in the right place. Something is going on there. Uh, now, if we have a look, as I was saying, uh, the towers, that's that's not the same as before. The, the E in the monument uh, wasn't there. It's here, there. Uh, likewise, I believe there's a double L here, which wasn't, if we have a look, which wasn't uh, in the palaces here. OK, so we've got the, the figure of addition uh, and subtraction going on here. And there's just so much brilliance. You've got an E on the end of solemn, which wasn't there in the monument. You have an E on the end of self, which wasn't there before. Uh, likewise on dissolve. Uh, if you notice back in the um, here, the W is a bit skew if it's, a, it's an R. Uh, so again, we can have a look and you can see... Um, that the double V is slightly different. You're looking at the similitudes and differences that are kind of highlighting key features of this. Um, you've got this line here, insubstantial double L there. Notice it. Double Ls are important, as you'll see. Uh, pageant faded, a pageant like a performance uh, faded. So there's clearly uh, some uh, performance uh, going on here. 
and a base a baseless fabric much like uh, let's say a costly curtain to to hide a player there's there's some player that's going on here leave not a rack um well if you look back it's actually a wreck that's because wreck is really important not just in the sonnets but in uh, something i'll leave you to read at the end just because it's a lot of fun uh, eon behind stuff uh, sleep oh, lots of lots of these magic e's every time an e is used it's telling you there's some form of cunning uh, conceit going on uh, so you can see there's a lot of these magic e's going on here um uh, and if you look so the tempest was uh, is believed to be shakespeare's last play and the epilogue is is the last speech spoken um, after the play by Prospero, who's believed to um, represent uh, Shakespeare or Edward de Vere. Um, now, the thing that I kind of actually realised today, uh, now I knew this was important, but what I didn't see uh, was, um, I knew this, now I want spirits to enforce art to enchant, uh, was the spirits, where you've got your spirits and he tells you directly next to it who his spirits are. Iris, Ceres, Juno, Nymphs and Reapers. Well, where do these spirits appear? Uh, but all of them directly before uh, this bit. All of the spirits are directly before uh, this bit here where he's really uh, showing you um, uh, kind of what's going on with that monument. Okay, so, and again, loads of devices. We've got these magic conceits, E, this figure of surplus, uh, which I hope you're becoming really, really familiar. Uh, you've got this uninhabited. I'll talk about un maybe a little bit later, but you've got the V, you've got the names. Remember the double V here? Maybe you've got your two Vs here. Also note that C uh, on actors, much like uh, the Ben Johnson's one. Um, wonder who was being the actor there. Now, there's also something just lovely in this, which I really like. Now, as I said, Hamlet gives instructions to understand both uh, the monuments at um, Stratford and Westminster. Um, and the thing that first kind of alerted me to what's going on here uh, was what Osric um, says. He plays his part very well indeed uh, and gives some very good instructions. But your lordship is right. Welcome back to Denmark. Now, this is left as a hanger the hangers are important but it was how it left this line just on a full stop i was like hmm how interesting well i thought well typically what people are pointing to they're, they're literally telling you what's going on so he's telling you these important but i thought well what happens if you continue where he's pointing to through this mark uh well so that's what i did i drew a straight line uh, starting at the e and through the mark and looked at what letters it's going through. So we've got a H, a double L, which you've already started seeing, uh, H and E, and ending on the E. So all these important letters, it seems to be kind of alerting your attention to. It's pointing to them. Uh, but you might be going, oh, well, you've told us about E and maybe a little bit double L, though you probably could explain, uh, Glenn, uh, what is actually going on there. Uh, but the H, why is the H important? Well, why is the H important? Uh, and actually, um, if you read uh, Pragmatographia, or the counterfeit, the figure of counterfeit uh, action, so doing one thing but meaning another. Um, but if such descriptions be made to represent the handling of any business with the circumstances belonging thereunto as the matter of a battle, notice the double L, a feast, a marriage, a burial, uh, well, that's super important, given the fact that I believe Edward de Vere is buried in Westminster, uh, and there's a double L on that, implying that something is going on there, or any other matter that heth in feet and activity, notice the U, uh, substitution, we call it then the counterfeit action. Now, the real um, jaw-dropping moment for me was that the heth. I didn't, I didn't know what heth meant, so I looked it up. Uh, and heth, or any matter that heth in feet, well, heth is just sheer brilliant uh, because heth is the eighth letter of many semitic alphabets and from the phoenician eighth letter het which is where it comes from uh, gave rise to the greek letter eta uh, which is lowercase looks like that and uppercase h now eta is a long e sound 
So if you may be familiar with the IHS uh, Christograms, this is the first three letters of Jesus in Greek. If you walk around the graveyard, you're probably going to see that at the top of it or in a church. IHS, very commonly used, it is the first three let letters of Jesus. Uh, so, uh, Hef is the, uh, as we've said, uh, so your second letter of Jesus is your H. So, in other words, your H is also your magic E. It's a very kind of crafty um, play uh, on what the H is going back to its history. Um, so, your Hef is, again, this magic conceit E. So, if you see any H, it probably also means e which is very very clever now if we uh, have a look quickly at the dedication to the sonnets of the sonnets published in 1609 uh, their dedication um, to the only begetter of these uh, ensuing sonnets mr w h all happiness and that eternity promised by uh, our ever-living poet wisheth the well wishing adventurer in setting forth t T. Uh, now, what's just incredible here is once you understand Heth, then you notice this. That is double V is Heth. It's it's saying that De Vere is Heth. It's telling you he is this cunning E, which is brilliant. It's, it's, it's really, really clear. By, so it's literally, if you have a look at the two lines, by uh, De Vere is Heth. It is literally telling you. But also, if you have a look at this one, which is brilliant as well, you've got your de V, your double V, and your H, your E. So you've got his initials, just backwards, Edward de Vere. Yeah? Absolutely brilliant. It's, it really is amazing. Um, and yeah, there's like there's, there's so much stuff like um, A, um, from like the Aleph and the Onk, uh, it has its history with the Ox, um, and T, the final letter of the Hebrew alphabet, um, which, as I said, is Tav the Mark. Both have a long history with the Ox. They're really, really important. There's loads of things going on here. Well wishing. Uh, this double L, which you've seen. Oh, look, we have our double V, R, E, and our L. Uh, you've got a nice little ISH, uh, IHS uh, anagram thing going on there, which is really lovely as well. There's loads going on. What's also really cool is I'll show you in my book if. Um, um, if you lay out this grid much like Alexander did uh, in his really fabulous um, video, um, uh, Shakespeare was a fake and I can prove it, which was the first video which kind of really kind of uh, woke me up uh, to the authorship question. So thank you to Alexander for just being a herald of this stuff. Um, is a uh, what was I saying? I can't even remember now. Um, yeah, if you take if you take this and lay it out in the grid, uh, you have. Um, you, it actually references the art of English poesy and the printer and crucially uh, love and uh, we can talk about that some other time. Uh, but also I, I went to the Westminster Abbey a few days ago and I found loads of really cool stuff around it. Uh, so, for instance, right um, adjacent to it, you have uh, William Wordsworth uh, and remember our noble gentleman. Like All of these poets knew this stuff. Many, many people and I'm sure many, many people still do. Uh, know, uh, are aware of who this author is. I believe now is the time uh, for it to come out. For It is the year of the ox, not superstitious, but it's poetic. Um, so uh, you've got nobler loves, really interesting things going on with the lines here, going from the E to the T. The, the uh, P, if you flip that, that's a D. Uh, and the E again, so there's, some, there's, there's more cunning there, and there's a lot of cunning to the stuff that's actually around it, which I might talk about some other stage uh, I do like a romantic poet uh, so uh, our wild goose chase is going to conclude itself in a minute well, with something else I accidentally managed to find how I keep having these accidents I have absolutely no idea they're not the only accidents I've have uh, I've, I've got I think a very important one as well but I just need to do a little bit of work on that um, so here's the herbal general history of plants. I think there's a reason why Shakespeare had such a encyclopedic knowledge of flowers and plants in his canon, um, because he he wrote a book on it. Uh, now immediately these double L's should be alerting you to the fact uh, that the herbal or general history of plants is likely 
um, to have been written. Ors are also important, but I'm not going to talk about that yet. Um, gathered by John Gerard. Do you notice the E on Gerard there? That's really interesting. Now, if we have a look, yeah, I, I'd encourage you to read all of the poems dedicated at the beginning of this. Uh, if, if someone is really good at Latin, please translate that for me because my Latin is not up to scratch. Uh, but here's something that's really, really important. So this is the uh, the preface by John Gerard. Notice the titles, particularly to the reader. That's the same title as the Ben Johnson uh, dedication. Uh, it, within this you have, I'm not going to read it, you can read it yourself, but there's loads of devices that are going on there, much akin uh, to the preface of the Art of English uh, Posey. This is very much uh, a brother to the Art of English Posey. Um, what I do want to draw, draw your awareness to is how he signs off. Thy sincere and unfeigned friend. Well, that's that's really interesting because sincere and unfeigned that would be a tautology why why are you needing to say that you're sincere you're un you're unfeigned uh, you're not fake in other words now un is really really important actually uh, there was uh, there's a brilliant scholar who I'll talk at at uh, the end um, called uh, uh, Richard Wargerman uh, who in a piece in 2010 who puts forward a, a, a claim for the art of English poesy uh, being by Shakespeare, although he misses the printer's preface, uh, he does some phenomenal work uh, within that, which is just amazing. Like, for instance, uh, saying that within the art of English poesy, Shakespeare coined, or Edward de Vere, coined the word coin itself. Likewise, he coined a lot of unwords. Most of the unwords um, he introduced. So, this unfeigned friend. Uh, so, that un, any word with un, which actually uh, you've already seen um, uh, a few of them, for instance, in the, in the Tempest thing I showed you. Uh, and also notice this, the John Gerard. Do you notice how that E has disappeared and it's been replaced by a full stop? You should be, just as with Richard Fields, uh, very aware any initial with a full stop after it um, in regards to this work, just because it might not be who uh, it is actually saying it is. Uh, so if we have a look after this printing pref uh, preface, uh, if we have a look at the picture that's directly after this. Well, this work, as is said, um, was published in 1597. Now, if you look at this picture, um, there's lots uh, going on uh, here. You might, if you're really, typically, if you can see these lines, there's going to be something hidden behind it. You might, I reckon there's a beer hiding behind there, um, actually. But the two things I actually want to draw your attention to uh, is this. Uh, the 1598, um, well, it was published in 1597, so that would be the year after this. Uh, but do you know what? Um, he teaches you in the figure of chronographia, which is um, counterfeit time, often uh, dates are not going to be right, which may explain, and I'll probably do this in another video, why the dates of publication of Shakespeare's work aren't... There's been some confusion around it. Uh, but more impo importantly, if you have a look at what he's pointing to, and if you have a look down here, you have, again, that double V. I strongly believe uh, this work is by De Beer. I've got a, a few reasons uh, why I, I really believe this work is by De Beer. But I've I've rabbited on enough. Um, we we're almost at an hour, which is crazy. Um, so I'm going to just quickly conclude with where do geese come from? Now, I've told you the first and last are often really, really important. Uh, so the last entry in the herbal or general history of plants uh, is this one. And this is where, as we all know, geese come from. So this is of the goose tree, the barnacle tree, or the tree bearing geese, uh, which I'm sh I'm sure one or two of us have seen in our lifetime. Here's a picture of this tree that is bearing uh, geese from its flowers. Uh, I'm going to let you read that. It's a really um, uh, good read. Very much enjoyed it. Uh, lots of interesting thing that, things there. Watch out for the shipwreck uh, and some other common devices that you might be seeing there. But I'm going to uh, conclude this. Uh, now uh, with a poem again from the first folio after the title page you've got some poems by Ben 
Johnson and others. Uh, so here we have, Thou art a monument without a tomb, and art alive still while thy book doth live, and we have wits to read and praise to give. Well, I hope there are a few wits out there uh, up for the read, uh, and we'll have praise uh, to give. That's uh, by Ben Johnson. It's by Ben Johnson. That's by uh, that's by Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson. It's by Ben Johnson. Uh, interestingly, in Westminster Abbey, he's the only person that's buried standing up. And I think uh, he was very rare. Uh, indeed, he, of course, does teach about uh, the, in the last uh, figure he teaches in book three is the ambiguous. Um, and there are a few names in there um, as well. Uh, to suggest that maybe people aren't who they uh, are saying they are. Uh, and actually, this has been a very elaborate and witty game uh, that a lot of people have been drawn in uh, to playing. And I highly commend uh, such excellent cunning uh, in the sport. So I wrote about um, a lot of this stuff in uh, my book, as I said, the author. Um, which has got some more things in there that I might make some videos about in future. Uh, forgive its faults. I did write it in four weeks uh, while I was very, very tired and very, very excited. Uh, but hopefully it will stimulate discussion and get some of these ideas out there. Uh, so I'd like to wrap up by just saying uh, my thanks um, and deferring you to uh, some things that I think you should see. Uh, so first off, uh, if you want any autobiographical uh, details on Edward de Vere, I'd highly recommend uh, that you read this book. I adore this book, Shakespeare by Another Name, um, by Mark Anderson. I think it's absolutely terrific, very well uh, written, unlike my book, um, but it's really, really important. Uh, if you want to know more about Edward de Vere, I'd encourage you to uh, join the de Vere Society, which is our the society for de Vere in the UK, um, but I suppose anyone in the world could join. Um, and yeah, it's wonderful. The Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship in the US. And again, it's a fantastic organisation with loads of brilliant people doing lots of brilliant stuff. Uh, Shakespeare Authorship uh, Trust in the UK as well has been uh, championing, uh, championing, I can't even speak anymore, I'm so tired. Uh, champion, championing, champion, championing <sighs> um, questions of authorship for quite uh, a while. Um, we have this fantastic gentleman down here. Uh, this is uh, Richard uh, Rick Wargerman, um, who wrote uh, in 2010 a very brilliant uh, piece. I'll, I'll put some details and links uh, in the comments so you can um, have a look at it. Um, but yeah, he, he wrote something very brilliant, which I really, really like. Um, and this guy decides, uh, deserves to live forever. This is William Lowe's Rushton, who in 1909 wrote a very witty book called Shakespeare and the Art of English Poesy, um, which draws commonalities between Shakespeare and the Art of English Poesy. But it does more than that. He actually uses a lot of devices um, that Edward uh, used to insinuate he knows exactly who it is. And he tells you he actually also... Uh, is a barrister at Gray's Inn where De Vere trained, uh, interestingly enough, and starts his um, book with a very uh, funny joke in uh, Greek, uh, which I put on my Twitter the other day, actually. Uh, and lastly, to say a huge thank you and to pay my tribute to effectively the godfather of us all, uh, Alexander Wall, uh, who is brilliant and incredible in so many ways. Uh, I'd very much encourage you to check out all of the brilliant stuff he's done on his uh, YouTube uh, channel. Please go there, subscribe. I'm sure like there'll be many more brilliant things that he'll post. Um, he's yeah, he's he's incredible. He was the first person uh, after I emailed him a couple of months ago that encouraged me to start uh, kind of writing uh, about this. Um, so thank you, uh, Alexander, for the encouragement and just being the loveliest guy ever. Um, and yeah, I'll put some links uh, in the comments uh, to uh, some of my favourite videos from his. So you can, you can go check uh, those out. Uh, I also believe he's working with another scholar, um, uh, Roger Stripmatter, uh, who's, I think he was the first person ever to get a PhD um, in this research. Um, I believe he's working with him to uh, write a 
uh, book that is either coming out this year or next year, which I'm sure will be incredibly important uh, and a fantastic read. Uh, so please do check that out when that comes out. Um, and yet, uh, the last thing I have to say is please do read The Art of English Posy because it is a masterpiece. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a masterpiece. Read it, but don't please miss the printer's preface because that is very important. Anyway, thank you very much uh, for staying with me. Apologies about all the rambling, um, but thank you very much. And uh, yeah, uh, take care.